anyway, we came out of our, our eighth Bergman for the week, and so we went to a pub, and well, we were talking Swedish. <laughs> and then we heard two Swedes behind <laughs> us. So we had to switch to Irish, because we would have been in trouble. <laughs> OK, so you can be absent from the joke, and then when the people laugh, you laugh with them. You become present. How many of you have had that experience? The, the, the sheer sharing of laughter. Uh, you're together. Now, prior to that, if it's your language, then you can get in on the joke, and this is happening to you. As I mentioned in the first half, it may not ha be happening through the class, but then suddenly this is stirred. I I'm interested. OK, and what are you in interested in? In some flow, what is going on? What I will call regularly the mess. The, the, the flow of life, the flow of the, the puzzle, the flow of the joke. Uh, you want to make sense. Now, that's very normal in the best sense. One of you mentioned uh, the interval that you don't like the word normal. Neither do I, in a sense, because we have become normal in an abominable sense in the 20th century. What we're trying to discover now is a normal that is no longer normal. A normal that is within each of us and that was alive and well at the age of three. Look up the text, Wealth of Self, page 17. It's about the child going to the zoo. And the child is normal. What does that mean? The child is excited. And going with mommy or daddy to the zoo and looking around. And what? What's that? And the parent looks at the bottom of the cage and says, it's a wallaby. And the child is still normal. So the child says, what's a wallaby? And the parent has died years ago. So the parent says, shut up. That's a wallaby. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah? The death of the three-year-old. <laughs> Am I being sufficiently cheerful? <laughs> now, I could go on for hours about the death of the, the, the mental abuse of, of children like that. Some parents, for instance, are so hell-bent on keeping their walls beautifully painted that the artistic tendencies in the three-year-old are frustrated. Please do not be alive. I, I need that clean wall. OK, then it's probably beige. <laughs> OK, so that's the first thing. Notice, are you interested? And now be honest with yourselves. No, I'm waiting till you give me the damned answer. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you after class. <laughs> OK, you're interested in the mess. Now, the problem of interest is that human beings never know when to be interested. And it, it, it's, a, it's a tragic element in being human. There's the famous apocryphal story, but it's a good story, about the boy who decided that he'd walk to the bridge and jump off, provided nobody smiled at him on the way. And the story goes, nobody smiled at him on the way, and he jumped off the bridge. Well, the problem is, if he did, where did the story come from? <laughs> OK, but in other words, you, you never know when to be alert and attentive and interested. You've all had that experience, surely. I should have noticed. I should have known. Somebody you find out later is very sick, very disappointed, whatever. You weren't, you weren't alert. We'll meet that very much when we talk about belief, the alertness in asking for directions, whether they're re directions of the way to what I call the bird zone, or the directions, say, of the way, the Tao, religious way. It, it's the same thing. Being alive, uh, open, puzzled, interested. Now, should you be interested in this? I think so. 
but, but it's up to you to find out. There's a sense in which this could represent, as I mentioned at the end, yeah, th this is life. What is life? I it's a series of ups and downs. Yeah? And you want to make sense of it. So there's a sense in which this is, a is parallel to the entire puzzle of the course, or the entire puzzle of life. And what we're looking for is a jump. That, that you nod, and, and I hope it's going to happen to some of you in the next 20 minutes. There's a jump, and, and yeah, and I see one of you grinning, you've got it. Yeah? Uh, and it's a jump, and it puts the whole thing together in one leap. How does, how does it do it? And again, remember my five points? It's not memory. It's creative. You, you're you're going to do this. No matter how much I draw on the blackboard, you have to do something that is you being creative. There's a jump in you that will occur, that may occur, that is terrifically exciting. Archimedes had one of these. You remember the story of Archimedes? Uh, he was in the baths. The king had given him the problem of finding out, did the man who made the crown cheat, a crown made of gold? Could have put in a little ledge, you know, or built in holes, pumped in air. And Archimedes was trying to figure out, how can I find out how much gold is in the crown? So he went off to have a bath, great thing to do, and flopped around in the bath, and then it hit him. And he shouted, Eureka, I've got it. How many of you use the word Eureka or know it? Yeah. It's the Greek for, I've got it. And he's the first streaker in history. Did, did you have this streaking era here? We had it in Ireland. Last streaker I saw in Ireland was a, a woman running across a football field. It was terrific. <laughs> Bright, brightened up the half time. <laughs> anyway, Alcamin has leaped out of the bath and galloped, galloped along shouting, I, I have it. it it's just a, a jump. And how does it come? It comes in relaxation. Remember what I said about the joke? You're not uptight. You're taking your time. It's slow. You're repetitious. Everything I said at the beginning comes around in each of these puzzles. And you, you, you're not rushed. Now, that, that's something that you may be unaccustomed to. There's a way in which, in our living, we are hurried on towards death. No great pause. You're under pressure, say, in your education, trying to do five credits, essays, books to read. The crazy American Ezra Pound, some of you may know of, he wrote comments on a famous French book by Gustave Flaubert. Flaubert wrote a book in the last century called Bovard et Pécuchet. And it's about two busy fellows. And they're busy and busy and busy. And Pound says, Flaubert anticipated the 20th century. Yeah? There's a way in which we live in a normal pace that's quite crazy. So this... This may invite you to do something very silly. Spend a couple of hours where we get further to these tasks. It, it's the key to the course. And I, I put down this optimistically in that I may convince some of you that this is not tankless, <laughs> that these are tankful tasks in a lot of ambiguous ways. I'm so grateful that you've slowed me down. Well, maybe somebody will tell me that. If, if any of my, I'll talk later about uh, my correspondence with the, the people who are sitting out there drinking beer and eating popcorn. But uh, if you want to, to sort of say bad things about the course, write to the president. <laughs> she has a lot more time. Well, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I, I do invite comments seriously. But we'll get round to that shortly. But I'm hoping that yeah these will eventually emerge as thankful tasks. You discover something about yourself. For instance, I mentioned logic. This is, this is a definition in the books. Definition of reasoning. 
premises to conclusion. You've got to be logical. It's, it's related to the, the Western tradition, where there's an emphasis on logic. You read Newton's book on physics, it's logically structured. A lot of teaching is logically structured. I was in mathematics for four years as a student, and almost all the professors presented things logically. What did that mean for us? We took notes. Nothing was going on. There were two professors in four years who actually taught us intelligently, and we got a few insights. Now, I don't know whether that's the way it is in North American mathematics. From, from colleagues I have, I find that, yeah, there's a lot of this. I have a friend in New York in a, in a mathematics department, and he says that the graduate students have worked their way through with technique, and they teach this way. And the students don't get any insights. So maybe this could be a discovery. OK, curious about the mess. This is a mess. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't hang together. Again, I'm, I'm referring forward to the, the texts now, because I, I, I realize my nine points are not going to be covered. Uh, I very much emphasize detecting. In the, in the text. This is detecting. This is a detective work. You've got to tease out the clues. Uh, many of you read detective novels uh, of the, the sort of puzzly sort. Agatha Christie, yeah? You don't? I know you don't have time. You're doing five credits. Uh, surely, I mean, do you see the odd film of, of, say, Agatha Christie? No? Yeah? What do you do in your spare time? OK, in these novels, you, you, you normally have clues laid out. And, and you might take time to try and sort it out. Is Agatha Christie cheating you? Uh, and you're working through. Remember the novel, The Ten Little Indians? Uh, and it, it's very tricky how you come to the end and find out who is the murderer. It's the same sort of thing. You have a sequence of events. Now, what we're doing here is not just detecting, but detecting, detecting. And I know it's going to take half the course to get over that double, that repetition. Detecting, detecting. I mentioned that the 11-year-olds can do this, detect. But they don't do what we're trying to do. We're trying to detect the detecting. OK? Let's. Draw a line down the blackboard here. OK. So what are we trying to do here? We're trying to solve a puzzle. OK. Solve a puzzle. That's one thing. And that's what the 11-year-old does. We're, we're, what we're trying to do, or I'm trying to get you to do, are you yawning? <laughs> what I'm trying to get you to do is, I'm trying to get you to puzzle about that. Puzzle about solving a puzzle. <laughs> OK? And that's not easy. So what I, wa I want you to notice is, well, OK, I'm interested. Maybe. Maybe I'm just annoyed. Get on with it. And if you're interested, you've got to muck around. And eventually, there's a jump. And that jump will give you, let me say, take it in a simple sense, a law. There's a law. Later, I'll call it a serious concept. And, and this is a very tricky problem. Getting a concept means that you've had an insight. I mentioned earlier I was giving you a definition. No, I was giving you words on the blackboard. You do not get a concept by memorizing words. Go back to the definition of the circle. You memorized it in class and school. 
the locus of coplanar points equidistant from a fixed point. What did you get? You got a longer name for the same problem. Hmm? Does that make sense? How many of you remember memorizing something like that? Huh? You're doing geometry in grade 9 or whatever, and you, you have to have this for the exam. What is a circle? A locus of coplanar points. See, yeah? Yeah. Is that gone out of date? In, yeah? You did do it, yes. And it's gone. Why? Because that's not a definition. A definition is something you get at by understanding. Think of a definition of a friend. It involves understanding the friend. But we we'll get to that later. OK, you make a jump. You get a law. You're looking for what? What's the connection? What's the rule? What's the law? You make a jump. And if you get a jump, and some people get all sorts of funny jumps here. I, I've had all sorts of curious answers to this puzzle. One person sung an answer to me. And it's marvelous. It's a bit like Doe a Deer. If any of you remember? Yeah? <laughs> OK. So you get some insight. And then you spontaneously ask, is this right on? Uh, and some of you have done that with me. This is what I think. Is it OK? And, uh, and there's another jump. And you can say yes. Now, we, we will take a couple of weeks to sort that part of reasoning out. Yes, I'm right on. I've got it. OK, let's go back to this. Now, don't forget, we're detecting, detecting. What are we trying to do? We're trying to find out what do we do when we reason. OK? Yeah? Fair enough. So, so, so we're tackling this like the dog. How many legs does the dog? We'll check out with the dog. Reasoning. What's reasoning? Check it out. How? Now, some of you might think, well, I'll go to the library and get a big book on reasoning. No, no, it's something you've been doing since you were small. Gradually, perhaps, you've st stopped doing it. You have become a very dull, boring person, yeah? How many, how many of you are dull, boring? And <laughs> it's it's a, an easy way of living, you know? No ups, no downs. OK. Alert, interested, and so where do we go from here? Now, at least one, two people have this. Uh, any more? We've got three people who, who actually know the answer. How do I help you get the answer? OK. Now, I'm going to refer back to my list here. We're still on our trivial trial. I'm going to refer forward to 6, if you have it written down. 6 is the theorem. And the theorem goes back to Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. You get the answer insofar as I help you by changing the mess. Is that fair enough? There's nothing abnormal in this. I just want you to notice this. I change this by, for instance, adding letters. G, H, I, J. Anyone clicking? Yeah? You've got to relax over it. Try and be uncomplicated. It's for 11-year-olds. Why am I putting those up and those down? H, I, J, K, L, M, N. Somebody's got the answer. P. Ah, Q. <laughs> How are we doing? Anything happening? Yes? 
<laughs> All right, so let's put Q in its normal writing. Now, I did this with my sociology friend in, in Ireland, and we went on and on right through the alphabet. Do I have to go any further with you folk? R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. That's how I divide, divide the alphabet. Why? Now, with my, my friend, I, I went on. For instance, I started drawing faces. Does that help? Yes? Does it? <laughs> no? <laughs> I'm sure it helps. And if it doesn't help, well, keep working at it. OK? <laughs> you didn't expect me to give you the answer, did you? <laughs> OK, so some of you haven't got it. Uh, struggle with it. OK, it's the beginnings of our topic. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to get you to notice something. And it's not important that you solve this. It's important that you try so that you find what it is to really puzzle over something. Some of us can go through life without an awful lot of puzzling until there's a crisis. You suddenly discover you've cancer or a friend has AIDS, or something like that. And yeah, then you really, you, you can wake up. My heavens, what am I going to do? But we shouldn't have to wait for the crisis to be alive. We'll talk later about the importance of the crisis in, in staying alive. Somehow we don't learn easily. We have to be teased into it. OK, so you don't have to solve the puzzle to discover this. But you do have to try. You can write down these diagrams. I I've given you the, the single page sum up of the diagrams. And the people out in the real world will, will get it in the post. Uh, the diagrams are on page 100 of the text process and on pages 15 and 48 of the book Wealth. And you can easily memorize them. I don't want you to memorize them. So you can easily memorize this diagram, puzzling about some sort of mess, so that eventually you get an insight. And then you have, say, a concept. You can be logical, that sort of thing. A law, let's call it, you have a serious concept as opposed to a name. Now, I, I want you to discover that and discover it about yourself. And I don't want you to, to agree with me. Fair enough? This is an experimental course, and you are the data. You're familiar with the word data, certainly since the new generation in Star Trek. OK. Data is simply the plural of given. You are a bundle of givens. You are you, and you are reasonable. And what is that in you that is reason? I'm suggesting that it's this. It's the possibility of puzzling about the messes in life, the flow of life, Simple diagrams, uh, complex stories. I think, for instance, of, of the way Jesus taught. The, the story, say, of somebody asking, what is charity? Who is my neighbor? Now, the modern tendency is to give a definition, which is a string of words. What does Jesus do? He says, well, there's this guy who's going down the highway. And he goes into the ranch and reef or wherever. He has a few drinks and comes out and he falls in the road. And 
I won't say who sweeps past. Let's say X sweeps past in a big car and looks down and drives on. And then eventually another drunk comes along and sees the first drunk and picks up and so on. Yeah, who's whose neighbor? And the, the end of the story twists the thing backwards. Who was neighbor to the man in the ditch? What's going on there? An appeal to normal interest and curiosity. That if you think about it, yeah, you go away and you figure out. You get a, a diagram, a narrative, and th this is our theorem in Aristotle or in Thomas Aquinas. You'll find in, find in Wealth, chapter 2, a translation of the relevant piece in Thomas. That's Thomas Aquinas. He wrote a big book called the Summa Theologica, about 725 years ago. He was condemned a little later. A big book, and in the first part, he has a question, 84, and a part of that question, Article 7, do you need a, a, an image if you want to understand? And he says, try it. It's, it's a famous article in, in various ways. For instance, the great Catholic theologian, or the apparently great Catholic theologian, Karl Ranner, wrote an entire book about this, about this article. Geist im Welt. I, I like to translate that as Ghost in the Machine, but the, the title of the translation is Spirit in the World. And it's all about this article, and he missed the point. How do you get the point? By actually trying this. So there's my question. Is this trivial? And I hope it will become thankful that, yeah, these exercises are relevant to discover me and eventually to discover that this is what constitutes me and what constitutes my desires and what gives me my notion of God in any religion. Okay, let me swing to the question of the texts after our trivial t trial. I, I don't know, has anyone any question about the trivial trial? I'm not going to give you the answer. Some of you may get it. Those of you who are, are not immediately present can write your possible answers if you think you've got it. And I, I, I may find new answers. It's marvelous. Uh, I usually end up covered in chalk dust. <laughs> OK, so we leave that unsolved. And, and it's doubly unsolved, OK? We haven't solved the puzzle, and we haven't solved the puzzle of the puzzler. Who is the puzzler? That's the topic of the course. Now, I won't comment further on the title. I want to move on a little bit, and we, we'll oscillate backwards and forwards. The texts and the talks. Uh, I regularly have trouble with my publishers. I talked to a publisher this afternoon uh, about the difficulty of process. And with, the, with Wealth of Self, the first text, or the second text, in fact, process is the dominant text. The, the publisher originally said to me, you can't say that to people. Well, now, what did he mean? Uh, on, on, in the text, there was a turnover of a page, which we'll get to, where I said, You've skipped the last page, haven't you? <laughs> and, and yeah, a lot of readers find, oh God, I can't do that. And then, and it, it's not fair. This is what my editor said. It's not fair to tell the, the person, uh, you, you skipped the last page. Yeah? We don't like that. <laughs> so, and editors don't like it. So the texts are invitations to you to do this elaborately. Who am I? Yeah? Now, if you look at the title of the book process, the subtitle is in, in, uh, Inviting Themselves. Yeah? 
you. You are invited to discover yourself. And you may not want to. We're back to the question of teasing you to get another credit. Honestly, there are much easier credits to be had there. You know, there's psychology 300 and chemistry 400 and economics 500. Why stick with this? No? OK. So the text invites you to detect detecting. That's the main topic of the prologue. Now, you'll notice that when you read the prologue, uh, that was, that's the reading listed in the uh, outline for today, but really for this week. You'll find I'm talking about detecting, detecting, detecting yourself, finding experiences in which you can detect yourselves. Finding people you admire that somehow are alive and detecting full. It invites you to spirobics. I mentioned that in the prologue. What do I mean by spirobics? I made up the word myself. It's not in the dictionary. Spirobics is the spirit equivalent of aerobics. OK? So this is an exercise class. Is that OK? Now, suppose you, you, you came to the mount for an aerobics class, and, and, and you sat around like this. Uh, w wouldn't you feel sort of silly? Yeah? I, I'm, I'm doing a course on aerobics. <laughs> yeah? Or let's take, say, something like swimming. Uh, and you're all in class. Well, even then, you, you'd be making some movements, and the instructor is there, and you're all standing there doing the breaststroke. <laughs> yeah? You're not in the water. OK, I'm asking you to do something on the level of mind. Exercise that neglected muscle. And find out what it is. And it's very difficult. We've all got this muscle. It's the same muscle we use in school and out of school, sometimes much less in school than out of school. Uh, finding out what it is, detecting, detecting. Uh, the prologue will in invite you to notice people that asked you to be serious. There's the famous Nadia Boulanger, the, the great musician. I, I mention some great women because it's, it's very difficult to find great role models. Uh, there's the woman Evans from the last century, better known as George Eliot. You'll find, I think, on page 220 that I quote the first page of her book, Middlemarch. It's, it's a marvelous page talking about trees of Avila as a woman. And she says down the page, there are many treeses who are not doing what Teresa did as a, she went off to convert the Arabs. But most of us just live in a small town, humdrum, everyday fashion. And she's writing about the greatness of that life. And she does it in the context of a, of a a village. And it's powerfully creative. Now, th the problem is to, to pick up, as I say, on something that gets you going, uh, that makes you realize that, yeah, there is more in me than memorizing my way through credits, than getting from nine to five, and so on. What is that more in me? Uh, I was thinking this morning of. The onion. I have this marvelous conundrum that uh, I dare to give you. The, the, the onion of, of reality, that little puzzle, well, there, there's a, the mess of human life is like a layered onion, and you, you have to keep paring, pe cutting down on it. And if you take it slowly, yeah, it's an amazing vegetable, an onion. Yeah? Many of you have cherished an onion and watched the designs on it and, yeah? No? We don't have time, I suppose. Oh, God. The smell also gets stronger. The smell, yeah, the smell gets stronger, yes. OK, so there's a sense in which that's the sort of detecting we're at. And uh, taking it slowly, it's very difficult. And you have to think of, say, somebody as great as George Eliot. And some of the paragraphs in that book are, are staggering in the insight she has. 
She talks about the fact that if we really developed our sensibility, we could hear the grass grow and the rabbit move. And she says, as it is, we are well uh, confined or numbed. A normal human life, normal in that other sense. Nor does foot feel being shod is another way of putting it. So it's a shift to detecting this and that's what the text invites you to do. Now what about the talks? Well, you'll find that I'm certainly not reading the text at you. That is a fatuous operation. Uh, Bernard Lonergan used to say that, or he said once anyway, he said that uh, lectures went out with Gutenberg. Now there's a sense in which that's not true. But uh, my talking here will, will help perhaps the reading in the text. It may not. You may find either here or the, the, the distant audience may find that, well, okay, he's given me a start and now I just want to read. Terrific. I, I, I don't require either presence or participation. You're, you're adults. I, I may not see your lovely faces again. Or oh, well, I may. Uh, the point is that I'm inviting you to do an exercise, and you can, be, you can do it. The text indicates, the, the text process indicates that we're only doing a bit of this course. It's a peak. You'll find in the prologue the list of lectures, 75 lectures. We only have 22. And the book only gives a certain number of hints. It's not, not it's, it's built that way to indicate that Little introductory hints. Now, so the talking may help you or it may not. You, you find that out. But the main point is that there's an invitation to detect something about yourself in reality. And it relates to being reasonable in the best sense, desirous, having impossible dreams, loneliness, now, in reading the text, you have to find your own pace. We're not in a hurry. One of the big problems in, in modern education is learning how to read and read slowly. In a class this morning, we spent an hour on a half sentence. It was marvelous. And it began to make sense. And we're back to the question of, say, Mozart. Uh, to actually pace yourself that way so that, yeah, what is wonder? And you can stop. And you can look around at your children, your brothers and sisters. You can look around at the absence of it, the modern horror. And to attend. And it's very difficult. And that's why I keep inviting you to drop the course. So the texts are to help you. Some people like to read them right through. Uh, and this can be terribly helpful. I, I would recommend, and I haven't got it in the list, that you read not only the prologue, foreword, etc. Read the afterword in process. I mentioned George Eliot. Uh, th that, that is brought out a little bit. Well, wh where is this leading? Well, it's leading to being normal <laughs> in the other sense. And being weird. Uh, Carl Jung, uh, I, I like the story of Carl Jung. It's in his Memories, Dreams, Reflections. He worked out a definition, two general definitions of human beings. The emphatically normal and the optionally neurotic. Now, and, and this came to him one day he was in Geneva and somebody turned up who wanted to be a therapist. And Young said he sat and interviewed the guy and eventually he said, yes, you have tremendous qualifications. The first thing you have to do is you, you have to go into therapy. And the guy looked at him and said, but, but I'm normal. But Young said, that's part of our, our school, that you actually have to go through therapy before moving through the rest of the program. And the guy said, but, but I'm normal. 
I'm normal. I, I'm, I'm normal. <laughs> so he had to eventually go into therapy. And after three weeks, they found he was completely nuts. <laughs> so he was emphatically normal. And Jung went on in, in this book to, to say, you can't live through this century if you're not optionally neurotic. You, you have to be a little crazy. You, you can get through it if you're emphatically normal. You, you have a routine. Uh, you're neurotically fixed in a certain routine. And you do the same thing day in, day out, weekends, yeah? And you don't like to be disturbed. But he says the other person is actually more human. They're a little daft. How many of you are a little crazy? Oh, good. <laughs> I'm not alone. So optionally neurotic. Uh, now, again, I'm back to the question of, the, the, say, the people who take things slowly, who struggle with things. They seem to be all weird. The people that we really admire whether it's Cezanne or Karl Marx. Both lived very odd lives. I mentioned the peak. Cezanne, that strange French man, he spent his entire life trying to paint one mountain, one peak. He was trying to peak at a peak. Yeah? And he's admired. Why? Precisely because he was human and the rest of us aren't. I have a wonderful video of his, which uh, we can't show in this class, but it's well worth seeing. It's a video on Cezanne. And the last line in the, in the video is Cezanne, his statement, all my contemporaries are assholes. <laughs> <laughs> he was alone as a painting quest. The man in the local gallery said, as long as I live, nothing of Cezanne will be hung in this gallery then that's pretty regular. You have to be long dead. Yeah? You know the definition, and, and you have to be from elsewhere too. You know the definition of an expert. Yeah? It's the son of a bitch from out of town. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so much for the text and the, the, the talks. So participation. I would like questions. And we will go slower in the, in the following classes. And there will be questions. And the questions will come from you and from outside. Now, the topic is you. And I have to find out the topic. Now, what do I mean by that? I want to get feedback. And I do this normally in class. Uh, what does that mean? I would like your names, obviously. The degree you're doing, the courses you've done already, the courses you're doing at present, and questions that you have about the course, about tonight, about today, about uh, what, where's the course going, what questions I've got about religion. Uh, so I, I need a feedback. The degree, I like to know the sort of color of the group, if you like. You may all be raving mad PR students. Or, uh, I don't know. Many of you are struggling through PR. Yes, you're almost there. Some of you are doing religious studies. None of you, I hope, are doing a major in philosophy because you'll never get a job. <laughs> OK, so I like that feedback. And the other thing I like to get is a photo. So if you have a photo of yourself, uh, put your name on the back, by the way. There's no good having a jumble of photos. And I, and I would like a recent one. Uh, you may have been a beautiful baby, but I prefer <laughs> Up to date. So if you can spare it, if you can't, I, I'll give it back to you if it's your one and only photo. You may hate getting your photo taken. So uh, I find that a help. It, it's like, say, Montgomery in the desert fighting Rommel. He kept a picture of Rommel on the wall. Yeah? Know thine enemy. <laughs> OK, so I, so I like to get the names and the faces sorted out. And this goes for the people at, at a distance. Uh, so information, questions, any sort of exchange. Uh, and uh, you may have some light on some of my puzzles. OK. Thankful tasks. Well, I'll come back to that. 
you'll notice in the list on the blackboard, why, I'm, why I can say I come, I'll come back to that, three, five, seven, and nine on the list I had on the blackboard, they're actually introductions to spirobics. Okay? So that's why I'm saying I'll come back to that. Uh, okay, I, I mentioned the theorem. The basic theorem is that you need a diagram to understand and that reasoning is jumping to conclusions, okay? Now you've got to find that out. Reasoning is jumping to conclusions. The, the, the definition I gave at the beginning was reasoning is going from premises to conclusions. Now, I, I hold that it doesn't hold for puzzling, and it, it doesn't hold for jokes, but you have to find that out, okay? Is that okay? I don't want you to agree with me. Okay? So, thankful tasks, this gets you back to the exercises. You'll find the exercises mentioned in the handout, 2.5, the section 2.5, and there are about 20 exercises. And I, I put down the first eight for this week. Now, I don't have to spell out the readings, but I do want to bring your attention to the exercise in seven. Seven is techniques, okay? And exercise seven, uh, I, I, it's a wonderful illustration of this puzzling, and I want you to work at it. Are you ready to do some homework? Uh, the exercise is a technique of multiplying with your fingers, okay? Yeah? And it's a technique. Now, what's a technique? A technique is a way of doing something without any understanding. And it's part of your education system. When we get a little further, you'll find in the chapter 3 of Wealth that taking square roots. How do you take square roots? There's, there's a simple technique. How many of you learned it? Yeah? Some stage in school, a technique for getting it. No? What do you do in school? <laughs> okay, so you can learn a technique. For instance, uh, you, your statistics course, you learn a lot of techniques. And I think in a lot of courses, you learn techniques. And sometimes, yeah, it's important to have the technique, and, and you don't need the understanding. I want you to notice when you have the technique and you haven't got an understanding. And we'll do that. Uh, next week, we'll, we'll take a square root. How many of you can take square roots without using gizmos? Yeah? No? I, so I'll have to teach you it as well. Well, it's good to know that. That'll give us an extra. Are you free for another two hours? Okay, so the technique I want to give you is multiplying with your fingers. Now, I want you to figure out why it works, okay? I want to multiply from 6 to 10, say, seven sixes. And I don't want to memorize seven sixes are. Does anyone know? Seven sixes? Oh, come on. 42. Oh, thank God. Seven sixes of 42. Okay, now, the way I do it is this. I call that six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And say seven sixes. I, I join seven to six, okay? Now, seven to six. And then I count the joined fingers and the ones below, there's only one below, as tens, okay? So we've got three tens, that's 30, okay? And then I've got three here and four here. Now, three fours are... Twelve. Wow, we're really making progress. Three fours are twelve. Okay, so thirty and twelve is forty-two. Huh? Is that nice? Eh? Isn't that nice? Okay, let's try. Let's try eight eights. Join the two eights finger. Have you got this now? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You join the two eights. Okay. Now, what have you got? You've got six tens, sixty, and two by two is four, sixty-four. Is that okay? Yeah. And so on, 9 eighths is 70, 1 by 2. That's 2. Yeah? 
It doesn't work, yeah? yeah? You like that? Come on, does, doesn't it work, yeah? Now, the problem is, why does it work? Yeah? Why does this work? What's the reason? Now, that should keep you busy for a week, eh? Sometimes I offer $20 to the person in the class who will do it on the blackboard the next class. Should I do that? Well, I don't think so. <laughs> All right, carry on.